Today, we will connect the dots between some astounding scientific discoveries and their practical, real-world applications. We'll demonstrate how light moves and use that knowledge to better catch fish, to better see the stars, and better machine our parts. The subject of this Haas Tip of the Day will change the way that we see our world. No kidding. When Tom Hanks was marooned on a deserted island in the film Castaway, his priorities quickly changed from getting packages out to survival. Now that is catching fish and trying to start a fire. Now he struggled with these tasks at first, like most of us would. But had he seen this video, we could have made things a bit easier for him with science. His first attempts at spearfishing left him empty handed. Here is why I think our friend might have missed. Tom is here. He sees the fish here. So he aims here and he throws and he misses. Our fish didn't move on us though. It was actually never there. Now every expert spear or bow fisherman knows that they need to aim low if they want to hit the actual fish, adjusting for refraction. The speed of light is 299-792-458 meters per second. Exactly. We think of this value as set in stone, as a constant, C, as in E equals MC squared. And it is constant, but only in a vacuum. The speed of light will actually change as it moves through transparent mediums of different densities. It is about 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum, slowing to around 225,000 kilometers a second as it moves through water, 200,000 kilometers in glass, and just 125,000 kilometers a second as it moves through diamond. And here's the amazing thing, with all kinds of applications, even for a machinist, as light moves from one transparent medium to another, speeding up or slowing down, it will bend. It will change directions in a very predictable, very repeatable way. Refraction. Materials like glass have a refractive index of about 1.52. Acrylic is slightly less at 1.489. Now, a refractive index is just a value given to each material recording how drastically it will bend light as it passes through. Now, these values are all based on Snell's law. If an imaginary line was drawn perpendicular to where the light enters a material, our angle of incidence, our refractive index would tell us how drastic the light can be expected to change directions. By changing the shape of our material, we can control and focus the light how we would like, creating our own lenses. Now, light passing through a convex lens, like we see here, can be focused into a single point. We might use a lens like this as a magnifying glass. Now, Tom would have loved to have had one of these on his island for a different reason. Now, the variable angles on our spherical magnifying glass lens refract the light from all different angles, focusing them in a single spot, a single location. Six out of 10 people in the world are wearing some form of corrective lenses. That's three fourths of us here in the United States. Now of those age 50 and older, 90% of us are wearing glasses. And by the time we reach age 75, nearly everyone has some type of lens on their eyes. These lenses have real world applications. In fact, in 1608, Hans Lippert a maker of eyeglasses in the Netherlands, patented the first telescope. A year later, Galileo Galilei hears about this and he builds his own, even more powerful refractive telescope with 20 times magnification. Galileo uses it to become the first person ever to see the rings of Saturn, to see four of Jupiter's moons, refraction. Now, lenses don't have to be made of glass or plastic though. Even water can be used to bend light, like we saw with spearfishing. We can use this vase as a lens. 
In this case, our focal point is so far away from our lens that the image is actually reversed. Liquid lens, focal point, and our logo so far away from our focal point that the image is reversed. Now any fluid that light can pass through can be used as a lens. Even a spherical bottle filled with water can be used as a magnifying glass. <laughs> Thermometers measure temperature. Voltmeters measure volts. Micrometers measure length or thickness and our refractometers measure refraction. By measuring how much the light refracts as it goes through a liquid, we can actually tell what kind of liquid we are dealing with or how concentrated it is. Beekeepers can use refractometers to measure the moisture content in their honey. Winemakers can use them to measure the sugar content of their grapes or to measure the amount of alcohol in their wines. Refractometers are used throughout the food and medical industries, but here in a machine shop, they play the critical role of telling us our machine coolant concentrations. If our machine coolant concentration drops below 4%, our machine and our parts could rust. A low concentration can cause us surface finish problems. It can lower our tool life, even causing our taps to break. Now, coolant above 10% can make our parts slimy, wasting coolant, while an 8% coolant concentration is usually ideal. Now, every brand of coolant is different and might require a little bit different ratio. Managing our coolant concentration is central to machining good parts. Our machine coolant helps fight bacteria, and it also helps to keep our pH levels in balance, which in turn are gonna keep away any fungal growth. This is one of the reasons why our machine coolant and our machine coolant concentration is so important. The precision lenses, scales, and stacked optics in our refractometers give us the precise data that we need to do our jobs. Before we use our refractometer, we will calibrate it by putting a few drops of water on our lens. We'll adjust the eyepiece, focusing things until we see a clean, sharp blue line. That blue line is actually a demarcation line painted onto the underside of our prism, the lens at the front of our refractometer. Adjusting a set screw, we can move an internal lens up or down, zeroing out our scale. We'll clean our lens and then place a few drops of our machine coolant onto our refractometer. We'll take a look and see what our coolant concentration is. Our machine coolant will have a different refractive index than our water, and so our internal blue line will appear in a different location. The blue line didn't move, it just appears to have moved, like Tom's fish in our tank appeared to be in a different location because of refraction. It will feel like we need to place a lot of coolant, our sample liquid, onto our refractometer, but it does not take much. Looking back at our fish tank, we can see that the light did all the bending it was going to do right where it moved from air to water, or blue jello in our case. That is our angle of incidence. It doesn't matter if our jello is eight inches thick or eight thousandths of an inch thick. The light bends at the intersection of these materials. We only need a few drops. The magic of a refractometer happens within this first initial lens. The light bends at a precise angle when moving only from air to glass. And if a thin layer of water were placed on the lens, the angle would change. And that angle would change again if the lens were covered with a thin layer of machine coolant. The angle would change depending on how concentrated our coolant was. Refraction changes the way we see our world. It changes the way we see other worlds. It will change the way that we machine our parts and even how we fish. 
We want you to be successful, and that includes successfully managing your machine coolant. We have a complete line of videos that go into the details of exactly how to use a refractometer, exactly how to keep your coolant managed properly. And we will link to those videos in the description. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching this Haas Tip of the Day.